welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forums Israel office, join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And now, with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and uh, good evening, everybody from Israel. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to sort of leave uh, the issue of coronavirus, the economy, to one side. We will deal with it, uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure, certainly with the questions as well. Uh, but I'd like to sort of take a look at um, what is always an eagerly anticipated event uh, in Israel and around the world, and that is Prime Minister Netanyahu's annual speech to the United Nations General Assembly. As everyone knows, every year all the leaders of the world, or designated leaders, doesn't necessarily have to be head of state or head of government, um, uh, gives the speech to the United Nations General Assembly. Um, Netanyahu did allow in the past Avigdor Lieberman, when he was foreign minister, uh, to give one speech. But since that time, I think that was, well, I should know because I was on his staff at the time, I think it was 2009, uh, 10, I think. Anyway, since that time, basically, Netanyahu was giving that speech and it's always been a great show. It's, he's usually come with, uh, with tools, with graphs, with pictures, with images, uh, and he certainly dis didn't disappoint this year for the first time, unprecedented. Uh, the leaders obviously didn't come to New York. Uh, they all did this by video conferencing. They all had this nice backdrops. Netanyahu showed uh, Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, the two big Israeli flags. Uh, and again, you know, uh, we, we had a nice sort of, um, uh, uh, let's say, tactic uh, uh, to basically reveal uh, Israeli intelligence uh, assets on what's going on in Beirut, specifically uh, Hezbollah's uh, stockpile of ammunition. And he knew very well what he was doing uh, to try and uh, gain attention to what Hezbollah is doing in Lebanon. Also, to send a message to the Lebanese people, this is what your so-called savior, your popular party, because it is, it remains a very popular party, a very popular organization in Lebanon, this is what it's doing. Certainly after the explosion in the uh, port of Beirut, which killed many people and left many, many more people injured and homeless, uh, to sort of bring attention to the, the stockpiles of Hezbollah was, was a very clever uh, strategy. But behind all of this was something that Netanyahu has gone back to again and again, and that is uh, the threat of Iran. Now we've talked uh, in the past about how many leaders, and Prime Minister Netanyahu is certainly one of those who's used a bit of distraction, deflection, uh, to try and uh, you know, move attention away from other failures, uh, what's going on with the coronavirus, which you know, part of it is certainly not within his grasp or any of his grasp. Um, but it's clear that Iran is, is not a distraction, it's not a deflection, it's something very deeply rooted within Netanyahu. It's something he believes more passionately, I would argue, than almost anything else, that he does believe that Iran is an exist, existential threat to, uh, to Israel. And he's worked very, very hard, all credit to him for many, many years, to draw attention to this. Uh, for many years, it has been on the agenda. Uh, you know, there's certainly a debate to be had to what level of success or failure. Obviously, the JCPOA, signed under the previous American administration, uh, was uh, a big blow to Israel's messaging that uh, they shouldn't allow uh, Iran to have a nuclear weapons capability because all this did was kick the can down the table. It didn't rule out uh, in Iran Iranian uh, nuclear weapons capability. All it did was say that it has to be suspended for a certain period of time, uh, not, uh, and, and it would allow certain uh, movement on uh, parts of their nuclear uh, capabilities in exchange for release, relief I should say, on sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. This was a big blow to Israel's diplomacy uh, when President Trump came in and you know, arguably ripped up the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. This was uh, certainly cheered in Jerusalem by all, left and right. Um, and the question is now, obviously, what's going to happen with sanctions? But again, it was very, very telling uh, 
uh, that Netanyahu chose once again to make Iran the centerpiece. Uh, obviously, he talked about the, uh, the recent normalization agreements with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, uh, and even held out an olive branch to the Palestinians saying, you know, that he's still willing uh, and able to meet with them and in, begin or carry on some sort of uh, peace process. What's interesting is that uh, it was mentioned to me earlier, I had a conversation maybe an hour or two ago, uh, where suddenly I thought to myself, you know, Mahmoud Abbas usually makes a lot of noise when it's his turn to speak. And don't forget the, the state of Palestine is, is recognized by uh, the UN uh, General Assembly. It is a recognized state. Mahmoud Abbas is the president of that state. Again, there is no such state in actuality, but this is something that's been recognized at the UN. So Mahmoud Abbas is given a platform the same as Netanyahu, as President Trump, and as all the other world leaders. And it's interesting, usually it makes a lot of noise, makes a lot of headlines in Israel and around the world. And what was interesting is I suddenly realized that I hadn't heard uh, anything about the speech. So I actually Googled it to see, and he actually gave it last Friday. And the interesting thing is it made almost no noise. If we think back to years uh, previous, Mahmoud Abbas's every word would be delivered by the media, uh, publications around the world, it'd be responded to by Israel, maybe other countries, you know, it'd be poured over, et cetera, et cetera. The fact remains that it, it barely got any attention, but I did find some excerpts of it. And what was most telling, I think, is his, you know, what, what can only be described as he, he, an exhaustion or even an understanding that the Palestinians are no longer front and center. Uh, I think especially the uh, normalization agreements with Arab countries. And it's clear that some other Muslim or Arab countries are gonna join and some other steps like Saudi Arabia's to allow Israeli planes to fly over their territory and, and various other uh, things that have happened recently. It shows that the Palestinians have lost a major hand. A major hand of theirs was the threat or you could say price that they would not be accepted in the region until they made peace according to the dictates and terms of the Palestinians. That has now been, you know, sort of at least pushed aside. And the Palestinian leadership is obviously extremely angry about that and extremely uh, uh, weary of the fact that they are losing this battle. They are getting sidelined. Their issues are no longer front and center. Their major card that they had uh, as a veto over Israel's place in the region has now been disrupted. Uh, so I think, you know, if we, look, if we look at these two speeches, we see on the one hand, Mahmoud Abbas basically giving a speech where he's almost, I wouldn't say giving up, he's certainly not giving up. You know, he did call for an international peace uh, conference and he obviously criticized Israel and his usual sort of, uh, uh, you know, rambling about Israel's uh, so-called illegal occupation, et cetera, et cetera. But on the whole, very few took this seriously, took notice of him, which I think is is fairly unprecedented. Uh, and Netanyahu, you know, made a speech that again was designed partly for uh, local domestic um, consumption. But again, the, the vast majority of it was sent as a warning to the international community. Iran is still the major threat, not just to Israel, but a threat to peace and stability in the region. If we look around the region, we see these normalization agreements and we see even within the Sunni Arab world of and others, we see, we see a great interest to try and lower the flames, to create more stability, less instability, that has basically been created by Iran. And at the root of these uh, normalization agreements, yes, Israel gains a lot from it, and even the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and others will gain from it. But at the root of it is this shared distrust, uh, dislike of Iran and what it's doing in the region. So I think uh, Netanyahu very cleverly and as usually very eloquently uh, basically tried to place Iran front and center because the sanctions uh, issue is coming up again. Uh, certainly President Trump wants to bring it up again. Um, and it remains to be seen whether the international community is going to bite. At the moment, the Europeans are pretty much uh, standing firm on this. They, they want to revive the JCPOA or keep it going as as long as possible, but it's, it's clearly a moribund agreement. The Iranians have openly defied it again and again, and uh, the Americans have finally called their bluff on it. So it, it remains to be seen what the Europeans will do, because there's a lot that can be done here, because uh, snapping the 
uh, the, the sanctions back would obviously be a major, major blow to the previous administration's policy. Uh, and it will certainly send a very strong message to Iran. It's something that the Iranians certainly do not want. So it remains to be seen where the Europeans are. So Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, is basically, you know, from his meetings, from his understandings, from the cables that he's receiving from our consulates and embassies around the world, he understands where the international community is vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So it's clear that uh, this is a very timely message and the fact that he, again, with everything going on with coronavirus, with the normalization agreements, with the economic situation, the fact that Iran was front and center, I think is very telling what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, and, you know, almost, almost every meeting, anybody comes into Israel, regardless of what the meeting's about, bilateral agreements, et cetera, et cetera, Prime Minister Netanyahu makes a point of always talking about Iran. What are Israel's expectations for countries in Europe and around the world to do in Iran, what it can do in Iran, what it should be doing on Iran. And certainly Israel is sharing a lot of their intelligence, what they're seeing, what's going on in Iran, especially on its nuclear weapons, uh, but also what it's doing uh, in the region with its destabilization, destabilization efforts, uh, chiefly in Lebanon. And the fact that Netanyahu went so public on Israel's intelligence to show what they're doing uh, with 100,000 plus rockets aimed at Israel as we speak, uh, shows exactly where Netanyahu would like the international focus to be at this point. Um, I'm happy to talk about coronavirus, happy to talk about all the other situation uh, in Israel, but I thought it, it would be, it's, it's important to sort of show that whatever else is going on in Israel, Netanyahu hasn't lost sight of this very, very important issue to him, something which is he sees as really probably his life goal. And his life goal, if you could ask him if he could do one thing, I'm sure it would be uh, to stop uh, Iran from uh, accruing nuclear weapons uh, capability. And so much of his work day and night is dedicated uh, to preventing that. So I'm happy to answer questions on this or anything else. All right, thank you so much. Uh, can you, you were talking about Lebanon earlier. Can you update us on the civil unrest and spread of Corona in Lebanon? And has the unrest spread beyond Beirut to the rest of the country? And has their reaction to Israel's disclosure disclosure of Hezbollah's arms ports in Beirut been? So I'll deal with the last part uh, first. Um, basically, so Hezbollah took an opportunity to try and get some PR out of this. And they did uh, try and organize a press junket, uh, invite the media to the location of where Israel and Netanyahu claimed uh, is an arms depot. And, you know, they tried to make a whole thing about this. There was chanting, there were slogans against Israel for Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but some of the, let's say, uh, you know, sort of not singing from the same uh, score sheet, uh, media basically uh, demonstrated that uh, Hezbollah did not allow the media actually to go where they wanted to. Apparently, they were allowed to see a very small square footage of where Netanyahu pointed uh, to the arms depot and they weren't allowed beyond that point. So it's clear that Hezbollah has something to hide. They try to demonstrate because they obviously feel the pressure. They understood that this message of Netanyahu is one way or another would seep into Lebanon. Uh, in this era of globalization, there's no way to prevent it. So they wanted to try and this was, this was more for their internal consumption than anything else. They understand that there's still a lot of anger, a lot of resentment uh, to what they're doing. You know, the, the explosion at the port hasn't been, you know, uh, let's say firmly credited to Hezbollah, but there are a lot of suspicions. And even if that particular explosion was not down to Hezbollah, it's clear that they have uh, a lot of other uh, commodities, assets around the country that could end in a similar way. So Netanyahu very cleverly wanted to try and bring attention to that. Um, and it's clear that there's, there's still this uh, anger and resentment and Hezbollah feeling it. Yes, it is uh, sweeping across the country. Um, but again, Hezbollah is not, you know, we on the outside world, we see it as a terrorist organization, as, a, as, a, as even a military, as an armed organization. But we've got to remember in Lebanon, it's also a social uh, organization. It's a political organization with a very strong hand uh, in the parliament and even in the government. So it goes far, far beyond what we see as a, as a militant, as a terrorist organization. 
So it has its supporters, it has a very strong base of supporters, but those on the other side of the aisle are certainly feeling a lot more anger to it and are allowing themselves to vent that anger in a more open fashion than for, for many years. Um, I don't know about their coronavirus, uh, what's going on uh, coronavirus uh, at this point, so I can't really answer that part of the question. All right, thank you. At what point will Israel decide it must attack Hezbollah's precision-guided missile sites in Lebanon? That's a very good question. Um, basically, it's policy, let's just say it's sort of active policy over the last few years has been uh, quite a simple one to ensure, you know, a, a few months ago, Israel uh, hasn't officially claimed it, but assassinated a senior Hezbollah official in Syria. Uh, one that Hezbollah has, has said that they will respond to, they will retaliate for. And we saw a couple of attempts uh, at retaliation over the last couple of months, but thankfully they were all failures. But uh, Hezbollah still claimed that they retained that right to, to retaliate. But the question that needs to be asked is what were Hezbollah, senior Hezbollah, doing in Syria? And what they were doing is they were passing uh, very uh, important armaments, missile capability, etc from Syria uh, to Lebanon. And what Israel has done is whenever it's seen a containment that it considers extremely worrying, it has usually tried to break up that uh, convoy. Um, again, not taking responsibility on most occasions. Every now and again, there's a hint by a senior Israeli leader exactly what they are doing. Um, but basically, that's their main active step that they've taken over the last few years is to stop as much as they can, because it is a very porous border between Lebanon and Syria, and especially for an organization that Hezbollah that knows the area very well, has obviously very strong allies on both sides of the border. Uh, they're trying daily, if not weekly, to get uh, to really beef up their uh, milita military abilities to, to, to get the latest technologies, etc., etc. I don't think Israel is going to do a preemptive strike. I don't think we're certainly not there at this point. Um, I don't think either side would really want something like that. So I don't see that uh, happening in the near future. So in the event that ever does become a reality, do you think anyone, Israel, Arabs, the US, is actually prepared to carry out a full-blown military attack to prevent Iranian nuclear weapons? That's the big question. Um, you know, a few years back, there was this big sort of talk and leak that Netanyahu was preparing to launch some sort of military strike uh, against I Iranian uh, facilities to do with their nuclear weapons uh, program. And there were other figures like at the time, Defense Minister Barak, who basically warned him off it. And in the end, they didn't do it. And were the Americans alerted? I mean, this was under President Obama. Were the Americans alerted? Uh, they obviously would have been against it at that point. Um, there was that window. That window is possibly been shut uh, for the moment. Uh, Israel certainly retains that ability, and I, and I can assure you without intimate knowledge of it, that Israel is preparing for every scenario. Uh, the Americans have stated on many, many occasions, and even President Obama said this, let alone President Trump, that all options remain on the table. Iran is not yet at that point of nuclear weapons capability. When they are, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, it changes the region, it changes everything, it changes the balance of power, it changes uh, uh, the ability of other countries to attack it, uh, as you can imagine. Um, I don't see it happening at this point in time, um, but what is happening with, these, with this, these closer ties between Israel and the Gulf countries, and not just the one it's officially normalized relations with, but the others like the Saudis, uh, from Oman and others, um, this is, you know, always the, 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 the number one point of any discussion. What is going on in Iran? What can we do to stop it? How can we cooperate? How can we coordinate, share intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So this, as I said in my opening remarks, this is really at the root um, of all cooperation that's happening now between Israel and the pragmatic uh, Sunni nations, especially in the Gulf. Um, so it remains to be seen exactly what level of action uh, will be taken. But at the moment, uh, there's assuredly a lot of below the radar uh, events and activities that are happening. Anything that can even push back at this point rather than stop uh, the nuclear weapons capability. 
Do you think that the Israelis should support democratic regime change in Iran? They would love to. <laughs> Everybody would love to. Everyone would love to see a regime change. The, the, the debate is how you go about it. You know, uh, any recent sort of uh, demonstrations have been largely stifled. You know, they, they haven't had the momentum that they did a number of years ago. I think it was called the Green Revolution, if I uh, remember correctly. And there was a lot of criticism. Maybe the American administration and President Obama should have done more uh, to help that because that was probably the greatest threat to the Ayatollahs, uh, probably before and since. Um, the, the big question is how do you even go about regime change in a country like Iran? You know, uh, many, many countries have tried it in lesser countries and not been able to succeed. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it would certainly be the dream of many countries, I'm sure, Israel uh, at the top, Saudi Arabia, America, and even the Europeans wouldn't be adverse to it, I'm sure. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily something that could be actually actively pursued from the outside. It has to be driven from the ground, uh, grassroots, and if some outside actors can assist, then that's something else. But it, it's, it's not a, it, I, I don't see necessarily a program that could be enacted uh, from the outside. Understood. Do you see any indication that the Europeans are going to wake up to reality about the Iran threat, or will they continue to keep their heads in the sands? The interesting thing, I, I always remember when I was in the foreign ministry and, you know, we used to meet with our European counterparts. And again, Iran was number one or number two item on the agenda. Um, and I remember the, the Europeans being even stronger, more hawkish on Iran than the Americans at the time, and especially the British. Uh, very, very hawkish. Uh, they pretty much towed the same line as, uh, as Israel. Um, and, then, and then basically, I think the Europeans lost faith in the process of, you know, uh, of, of trying to you know, take other measures. I, my, my assessment is um, that when they saw the Americans moving towards uh, some type of negotiations, they moved with it. They understood that this was the game in town and they became very addicted to it. And they kind of dropped to a certain extent. I don't want to, this statement may sound a little bit more harsh than this, but kind of dropped Israel in it a little bit and isolated Israel on this issue. Because I do remember some being in some conversations with some extremely hawkish foreign leaders who talked about Iran in very similar terms to how Israel saw it. Uh, but then that kind of changed when uh, what then became the JCPOA negotiations uh, when, when, they, when they started to uh, begin and crystallize, I think the Europeans decided to move from, from this hawkish to this more dovish stance and join uh, the American administration in these uh, negotiations with Iran. Got it. And can you comment on the apparent increasing closeness between Netanyahu and Naftali Bennett and what that means if there's another election in the foreseeable future? I don't know who asked that question, but I'm not sure where they're getting the information from because there's certainly no growing closeness that I can see or have heard of. If anything, the opposite is true. Uh, Naftali Bennett is more and more a threat to Netanyahu every day. We talked a little bit about this last week. Usually there's a poll. Uh, as I said last week, usually polls come out on Wednesday. There hasn't been a poll this week. Um, but if there was, I'm sure the the numbers wouldn't be any different and maybe even moving further away from Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu and Bennett, there's no love lost. Uh, we talked also about the fact that um, there's no love lost, not just between Benjamin Netanyahu, but also Sarah Netanyahu and other members of the uh, Netanyahu family. Uh, you know, uh, Naftali Bennett served as uh, Netanyahu's chief of staff when he was leader of the opposition. Uh, and then he and uh, Eilat Shaked, who was also on the staff, quit. And eventually they formed various parties and today it's called Yamina, uh, but they are the biggest threat. I think that uh, if anything, uh, Netanyahu may even want to hold on to Benny Gantz a little bit longer just to stay the threat uh, that Naftali Bennett uh, brings. Um, we have to wait and see if and when elections are called and we have to see if Naftali Bennett, because he's polled very well in the past, but for the first time to talk, turn polling numbers into actual Knesset seats because We've seen sometimes uh, the actual votes for uh, Bennett halved from what the polls were saying. So 
you know, everyone shouldn't be getting uh, too ahead of these numbers. But I, as I predicted quite a few months ago, Netanyahu's numbers are decreasing. Neti, uh, Naftali Bennett is seen as the only opposition today, the leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid, is at this point not able in any way to form a government. Uh, and his numbers are not really growing too much. Uh, but Naftali Bennett is seen as a serious contender. And so he's causing Netanyahu some sleepless nights. So I, I certainly don't think there's any closeness. I'm sure Netanyahu would love to bring him in to clip his wings a little bit. Uh, but I don't think, I think Bennett has learned uh, from his clashes with Netanyahu in recent years, where usually Netanyahu has won. And I think uh, Bennett, if he does uh, produce these sort of numbers in the next Knesset elections, will be a much harder person to bargain with. And they say he may even demand a rotation of the prime ministership with him coming first as opposed to second like Benny Gantz is. Um, so I, I don't see them uh, coming close at all uh, at this point. Uh, on the contrary, they are very much rivals at this point. Wonderful. So, well, not wonderful. Um, <laughs> in our last few minutes here, could you just give us a quick update on, on what's happening there with the coronavirus and the lockdown and all of that? Well, we are now uh, certainly in I think it's now over a week of uh, this severe lockdown, let's say, almost total lockdown. Um, the numbers are still growing. Uh, we, I believe yesterday for the first time, our numbers per whatever it is, 10,000 residents is, is greater even than the United States uh, for the amount of infections and even the numbers of people who are, who are passing away, who are seriously uh, ill, who are on ventilating machines is, is growing exponentially. Um, we won't know for at least another week what the effect of this lockdown will have. Um, it's certainly very severe, and there is talk that Netanyahu wants to make it even more severe. At the moment, we're allowed to leave our houses uh, up to one kilometer, unless you're part of the exceptions. Uh, but now Netanyahu wants to limit it to 200 meters, uh, which will obviously be very severe. Uh, there are some critics who say he's doing this just to get rid of demonstrations against him. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in recent days, we've heard the health minister and others talk about this going way beyond the two weeks, uh, maybe even a month, maybe even longer. Netanyahu came out with a remarkable statement today, which said that as opposed to the first, after the first lockdown, where everything pretty much opened within a couple of weeks, he now says that the reopening and the return to nor normality uh, could take six months, if not a year from the end of the lockdown. So the idea that we will be with some sort of restrictive measures uh, for up to another year is something I'm sure most Israelis will not, will not want to hear at this point because people are struggling uh, financially, emotionally, um, and there's a lot of anger at this point. So the thought that we you know, have to perhaps have some level of these restrictions for up to another year, is something that will not go down with the uh, Israeli public uh, but the question is, how long are we going to be in these restrictive um, measures? You know, there's over a million people out of work. There's many, many people who are going to be closing businesses in the coming weeks uh, who, will, you know, who will not be able to survive even weeks, let alone months, let alone up to a year. So this is going to be a very, very difficult time for uh, Netanyahu and this government because there's a lot of anger out there and it's growing day by day. Um, but the numbers are not coming down. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether this lockdown will have it. I mean, it will eventually have its desired effect because that's the nature of the thing. Um, but how long we'll be in this? And now people are already starting to talk about a third lockdown in January or February that could be coupled with the flu. Uh, that's, that's the thing that they're worried about uh, since the beginning. But we have seen some places around the world in the Southern Hemisphere, which already are, are leaving their winter, flu rates are actually lower uh, than usual because of the measures that we're taking against coronavirus. So that remains to be seen. What is clear is we're going to be going uh, towards the end of the year into a lockdown or into very, very uh, severe restrictions. And that is the key uh, moment when Netanyahu decides if this government should remain or not. Because as we know, uh, this government was given 100 days to try and pass a budget, an extra 100 days. And I think that runs out in the end of November or December. And that's one of uh, Netanyahu's sort of get out of the coalition free uh, moments where he can leave without Benny Gantz uh, taking six months in, in the Prime Minister's uh, office. Um, 
So it's going to be very hard for Netanyahu to call elections while having the country under lockdown. More than a million people unemployed, businesses closing left, right and center. So it's going to be a very, very um, difficult decision, especially as we talked about with Naftali Bennett uh, growing in the polls. Uh, and that's something he has to contend with as well. But the numbers are still not good. Um, and the lockdown in Israel seems to be it's going to be more than two weeks. It's probably going to be more than a month. And for the foreseeable future, Israel will be locked in this sort of battle about uh, exactly how to come out of this because Netanyahu learned that the quicker you come out of it, uh, the quicker you can go, come back into it in the second wave. And you certainly will not want a third wave. No one wants a third wave. Um, but it depends whether he can stand firm against all the sorts of outrage and all the sorts of clamor to open things up as we saw last time. That will be the big uh, key uh, that we'll probably see in a few weeks. We're still doing, uh, during the Jewish holidays, we have the festival of Sukkot coming up. Uh, after it is when the lockdown officially is supposed to end. And I think a few days after that, we'll see a lot of anger, protest, demonstration uh, against these restrictions. So we'll see how much the government can hold out against them. Understood. Well, good luck. Um, we have come to the close of our webinar. Thank you, Ashley, again for joining us today. Or, yeah, for updating us this week. <laughs> <laughs> for our viewers, please join us Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful day.